day to you. This is Adam Galactic. We are in a synthesis sequence where I seem to have a nearly infinite capacity or perhaps an asymptotic ability to delay <laughs> giving you the actual answer for reasons which I've gone on at length explaining why it's hard to state. So we're going to try to state it now again, which sounds like more of the same. Now, let's do it again. <laughs> well, each time <clears throat> I pray, we get closer, correct? And repetition is going to be needed here anyway. I've kind of come to grips with the fact that I'm not being totally deleterious and just delaying for the sake of being a D-I-K. All caps, by the way. And I am getting that trademarked for myself. D-I-K. All caps. Oh, yeah. Um... <clears throat> The quantum paradox. Already, we have a word which kind of is self... It's like, the first question you have to ask. This, this, I remember doing this. Paradox? It's, it's a, science? A science wouldn't really like that, would it? Well, no, Einstein sure is... The day is green. No, Einstein did not like it. Well, neither, neither did Schrodinger. And neither did Planck. And really, nobody's really liked it since. It's just, well, now after close to 100 years, we're kind of becoming, oh, oh, this affects all of us. I'm right up there trying to be befuddled with these guys. It's like, what, what, what stymies the scientists? I just wanted to know what it was. Well, actually, I have an ulterior motive. You really should, if you're serious about science, you should be doing it for yourself. Well, actually, I'm, I could be more forceful about that. I don't want to be forceful, but to guide you correctly, uh, you have to be doing it for yourself because you need to understand it first. Before anyone else can understand, you have to understand it. Now, if everyone else understands something, but you don't, which is where we really find ourselves most often, especially in the early part of life, when everybody knows everything else and you know nothing. That's a very, very good way to maintain yourself. Because <laughs> that's actually never going to change. We have an asymptotic curve towards ultimate truth. We will never achieve ultimate truth. But as an individual, we also have a similar trajectory, which, you know, you could say there's a curve of humanity. We call that science. It's really the legacy of science, the storehouse of science, and the results, the current operative results of science. Well, that tends to identify science in our minds, but you and I are of the opinion, or you wouldn't be watching this, is that science is actually something else and it's higher in the hierarchy. The technology is actually number two. It's in, <laughs> it's in ordinal position, not the first. It's not the top. It's not the definition of science. I find, even to this day, I find, I find, I may say that, and I wish that I had digested that fully, but I still think of science in two distinct ways. Well, I believe, and I'm just going to suggest now for everyone's sanity's sake, <laughs> is that that is actually natural philosophy, which used to be what science was called. And you may know all this, but I think it's worth repeating right now that science was not always called that. You could say that it's original, certainly you would have to say that it's more original name. This is in English, but it's, you know, it's French, German, Italian, and all other languages that participate in science. There's a storehouse of knowledge, there's been a, a progression. But you and I, when we come on the scene, well, in my case and your case, right now, would be the 21st century, well, that's now. Well, that means that you and I are young. You're always going to be young, Sonny. <laughs> so.
So when we look up to our scientists, there is nothing wrong with respecting them as accomplished men. I treat men exclusively that way. I'm not interested in what you <laughs> espouse. <laughs> you know, but, you know, friends, you listen to friends. Well, we're in a kind of a big world. I believe we have extended friendships. Because we're definitely coalescing in some way over the new communication waves, well, of course, that's wonderful. You would think that would also be good for science. Well, of course, all things are great in a perfect world. <laughs> but the way the world actually works, there's some intrigue in pr practically everything. And you would pray to God, of course, as we all pray to God, if we pray to God <laughs> at all, we would definitely include, you know, save science from the enemies. Don't let science go down, dear Lord, or we're all, you know, we can do without religions, but we cannot do without provable truth. Why is that? Why do I harp on that? Do, do you know? If you haven't tuned in, <laughs> you might not know. But I'm, I'm going to guess that you do know, and I'm just going to state what it is. We, we do science because we're blueprinted to get the truth. And why would, would that be of practical value? Oh, it's, of enor it's the most practical value thing that you can get in life. Because you can get out of all the shit. Once you have the truth, you don't need religion. That's why Yeshua, who was into religion in some way, or religion was into him, I think it's safe to say that you can identify religion if, if you're going to just choose one man, I would choose Yeshua. He seems like a religious enough guy since he actually died for what he believed in. And his name has never been forgotten. I don't see why anyone would want to forget his name. But he said, the truth shall make you free. Well, free from what? He showed you. He showed you <laughs> what it will make you free from. And you know what that is? You might answer religion. I mean, of course, I set you up for this trap. But the correct answer is not religion. Because religion is good. The correct answer is politics. Politics. Once you've even heard of politics, in my estimation, as a psychic doctor, <laughs> armchair doctor, of course, you know, just, ah, oh, what do we have here? You know, <laughs> I've ne never seen a schizophrenic person, but I follow Carl Jung. <laughs> that sort of person. I know that's not the top of the list, is it? But, you know, you got to start somewhere. Oh, you're going to be a babe in arms. You're going to be uh, an abused child. You're going to be a pre-puberty misfit. You're then going to go through puberty, and then your real woes are going to start. You're going to be ashamed. You're going to be crushed. You're going to feel like a failure. You're going to think you're going to die. You might try to take your life. You're going to be abused, passed around to your parents, or you're going to find out they're nuts. Then as you get older and you start to get a grip, you find out the whole world is nuts. Then they draft you and you get shot in Ukraine or Iran. Well, that's what's going to happen to your children, or if you're young enough, to you. Well, that's, the, that's been true since the beginning of time and worse. We live in, you could say, relatively peaceful time, but I can't really call it a relatively peaceful time when I know perfectly well what's happening just south of Har Megiddon. The mound, which is not a mountain, Har, which is Armageddon, that, yeah, it's... It's Har Megiddon. It's a tell in northern Israel. Well, south of Mount Shlomo, or whatever it's called. Israel. Oh, Israel. Really? That's back on the map? I studied that for so long because I, for years, I just literally couldn't believe it. Because it's like, I knew um, they weren't there for a long time. All my globes and maps and stamps, just coins and dollars from around the world, you know, 
paper money, I mean, not dollars, but there's no Israel. There was Palestine filled with not Israelis. Definitely were no Israelis there. It's owned by Germany, it's owned by Turkey, it's owned by the Huns, it's owned by Germany again. The French come through, the English take over. Is the Turks, the Saudis, then the Islam people, well, we got it, and then... And then Israel is back. It's like, how and on God's green earth did you get that nation back on the map? So it's kind of like that in science, for me, but I think for you too, if you're rational. What were you trained in, like, when you asked in school, where are we from? Or, you know, they just say, hey, we're going to find out where humans are from. I fuck. Well, that's the most exciting, that, that, school is fun. School is fun. We're going to learn something, get some understanding. Because don't you want to know where you're from? So you can f figure out how the fuck all of this is happening, good or bad. Well, yeah, you want to know where you're from. Yes, you know what you want to know where you're from. Well, what did they tell us? <laughs> Can anybody make a baboon sound? Do you know how to make a howler monkey sound? How about chimpanzee? You've heard that. I'm not going to do it, although I have. I mean, on in a video. <laughs> it's just at this exact point. I would. You want me to? No, I'm not. I don't do impersonations. And, and, and the, the thing is, is that there's no way Darwin. He really knew what he was even talking about, okay? So it was like a perfect theory, though, and so everyone was like, well, fuck, that makes better sense than the Bible. Well, I think anyone in their right mind would have to say that. Because it's a Bible, it, it, it's a book, you don't know, they don't, how do they know? So, of course, that, well, then science might know, well, Darwin came up with a damn good theory. I mean, you got to toast him here. I'm just toasting with water, but, I mean, Darwin, way to go. I think he was a great scientist. I think he did well, but he certainly was human. His father had, had already become famous, and his father was in the church. So Darwin kind of had some adolescent issues at some time of his life about his father being famous. Mr. Darwin, well... What are you doing, Charles Darwin? Well, I'll just figure out where people came from. Oh, he met it. Well, he devoted his whole life to it. I, I give full marks to Charles Darwin. There's nothing wrong with Charles. And also, I have no problem with his theory. Well, obviously, it was a great theory. He admitted he was wrong. He knew it was wrong. See, only I'm going to tell you the truth on, such, on these amazingly important details. Charles admitted in chapter 6, it's the problems with the theory. He only said it once. But I know how to read, Charlie, okay? He said that it probably isn't true. Actually, he said it way more forcefully than that. Well, what we were not taught at the very decade, this is the 60s and 70s, you've heard of Watson and Crick. They discovered the structure of DNA to a new threshold that was unheard of. A major breakthrough in scientific knowledge. A major discovery, equivalent to the discovery of the signature of light from galaxies. I mean, we're talking about epical, world-changing scientific events. And what was learned very quickly from just looking at this incredible double helix of, I think it's what, it's A, C, G, T, you probably know them, but just these four letters just wound and wound and wound around, billions of them, of course, and that's the genome. It's a code. It's called the DNA code. Do you know that you can go into any, well, I'll just say a huge library, a mathematical library or section there of another library is mathematics, you're going to find shelf after shelf of stuff on exactly that, code, coding. And what it said, as plain as day, 
Well, it's pretty obvious, and everybody had to look at each other after a while, but they just shied away from, and nobody really carefully brought up what was shown from the discovery of DNA code. That Darwin's theory was horseshit. <laughs> Darwin's theory is... Darwin knew it, it was wrong. Do you realize he knew it was wrong already? So who is it that believes a theory that even the discoverer said would probably, well, certainly, eventually be proved wrong? He was only pointing out morphological similarities. Now, of course, you know, then there's more evidence, right? Well, I think you know what it is. It's called stratigraphy. A really sedimentary rock holds on to shit. Bones, yes. Sedimentary rock will preserve bones. <laughs> Including dinosaurs. And it's like, what the fuck were those things? <laughs> Well, and they're all gone. It's like just like a crocodile or a lizard, or but not those goddamn things. <laughs> so I have nightmares. I hated dinosaurs. I wasn't one of those. Oh, get me a dino toy, or oh, I need a my my great nephew though. My great nephew is probably one of the world's well foremost experts on dinosaurs in his age bracket. He's not even in junior high yet. He knows everything about dinosaurs. He, you could say he loves them. Well, I don't think that's bad, but that wasn't my reaction. My reaction, of course, I was morbidly interested in them. Oh, I study, oh, like most boys, dinosaurs, fuck. But I mean, I, is dread. <laughs> Goddamn things. And then I saw Jurassic Park. I don't even know why I went to see this fucking movie. I had nightmares, man. Ah, oh, God, they're going to make them again. The geneticists, they're going to make them. No, don't do it. Yeah, God. Hey, drugs, beer. Get some fresh air. Go for a big, long trip. You need to start thinking about something else, Daddy. Oh, you can't keep thinking about those friggin' Tyrannosaurus Rex Velociraptor. I, I imagine there's probably millions of smaller ones. Just jump on your leg and take a chunk. Three more of them are hopping toward you. Fuck, you can't run fast enough. Flintstones. Meet the Flintstones. They named that goddamn dog Dino. I did not like that because Dino, Dino, that's Dean Martin. You can't call your goddamn dinosaur dog by the name of the one of the greatest singers of all time. Okay? Uh, you look at me. <laughs> and, you know, the whole show is a ripoff, you know, of the Honeymooners. Yeah, Jackie Gleason, fuck. Norton. Oh, what is it, Fred? It's same exact voices. They were sued. Well, there's dinosaurs. I'm just talking about dinomania, okay, is all I'm trying to say. Your professor is fine. I mean, obviously not. I mean, I hate natural selection. Because there has to be a reason why those goddamn dinosaurs were on Earth. And Darwin didn't seem to know what to say about that. Because, you know why? He didn't know why they died. Well, why aren't they still here? Well, that's not evolution. It doesn't work. Certainly, it didn't work for the dinosaurs. It wasn't until I was in my 30s. Well, actually, I heard of this, but I did, wasn't a scientist. I wasn't a scientist until my 50s. I know, but it's never too late, you know? Or for religion, you know? For you scientists, if you're in your 50s, bet, take up religion. It's not too late. You got to do both. I mean, come on. You know, you're not going to know until... You just become a monk. Just do something. <laughs> or or just read a lot. That's what I did. <laughs> well, that's what I did to catch up on science. It was, you know, I got out my Johnny Boy electro kit and started making chemicals, fizz, and, you know, 
You know, there's sparks, you know, an explosion from my room or basement every now and then? No. No, I just want to go, where are we at the edge? I want to go right up and meet the captain, go into the... You know, oh, little, little Scotty wants to talk with the pilot. And I actually did this because uh, I was fascinated with jets. <laughs> you can tell I had my... She liked to come up to the cockpit. You know, there's always a guy with a Western accent. Man, trustworthy. We're not going to crash, son. Come on up here. I'm like, I don't care. I don't ever think that way. Come on up and take a look. <laughs> well, that's how I was when I in my 50s. Just like that, a little kid. Oh, all right. All right, what's science doing? How, how far out in the universe have we gotten? You know, where's the hot spot? It's like going to the carnival. Hey, I want to go right to the big top. I want to buy the tickets. I'm ready. Let's get to the main event. I want to see, 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 daddy -o. Bring me in. <laughs> and so science was ready for me, oh God. Well, those dinosaurs you hated all your life were destroyed by a comet strike. I'm like, oh, really? Now I'm interested. Comet, yeah, 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 comet. <laughs> Sh shut up, Beavis. So I, I do one impersonation that I thought I'd choose the best, you know. Beavis and Butthead, I could do both of them. Mike Judd is un, Judge is unbelievable to watch. I saw him once. He, he looks just like you'd expect to do these. It's nothing against him. He, he just looks like a pro. Like He's actually dispassionate. But he gets into it. You know, he's being asked, you know, how did you come up with these voices, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Judge, Mike Judge? Beavis and Butthead fame, yeah. If, if you want to laugh, it's like you're you're thinking of suicide, delay your suicide. You know what I mean. You're expecting something bad or you just feel bad. Well, you turn on Beavis and Butthead does America the movie. And you'll find this for free on YouTube. So you, you won't regret this for the rest of your life. If you haven't seen it, oh, you you will need to see the fart. The fart. It's actually... It's actually, I think it's Butthead's father who cuts this fart in the, in the California desert, by the way. So this is local. <laughs> and that's what we were going to talk about as we get into hyperspace. What we're trying to do is make a dual overlaid sphere. Because now we have a spherical geometry that pretty much has made a major inroad into physics to explain phenomena and leading directly into unified everything. So we have the right geometry. And I've shown you where time is. It's, it, it's interesting that what Einstein, of course, wove into space was time. But we discovered where time actually comes from. It's a derivative. And it would have to be because it's linear. But that's local time. Local time is always linear. It's only in volume space that you need the relativity equation. Otherwise, time is linear. It's not curved. By the way, there's really no such thing as curved space-time, which I've heard so many dozens of times from accredited masters, that it's kind of irritating. Because if you see it correctly, which you can only do with spherical geometry, the time component comes from the spherical surface because it's rotating. Well, that's where you get time because you need a closed line to manifest time. You can't manifest time on a straight line. But what you can do is feel time on a straight line. That's correct. We feel time to be a vector with a constant quantization. That is, it's, a, it's actually continuous but not when we do measurements. Making a measurement on the universe interrupts continuous time. We experience time as a continuum. The reason for that is that it e exists from a closed line phenomenon. And closed line means circle. And that's the definition of the origin of motion. Because motion in the universe at this level, that is, the origination of motive force is energy. And that manifests on a sphere. 
it does not manifest as time it manifests a different domain function you could think of it and i believe this is the best way to say it it's actually another dimension but it's not it's not polar opposite it's not anti space instead it's orthogonal space and it turns out that the orthogonality is a spherical phenomenon that if you think of all the lines coming out from the center of a sphere you can think of that as one line and call it and call it the integral line i have shortened that to radial line but it's not one of those it's all of them that would be the integral line in spherical space well going out from the center that would be a force and that's called centrifugal force and that's one of the two forces that balance the universe at this scale you could certainly put it that way because there's an equal and opposite centripetal force in the universe that we all know what that is that's gravity but actually it's centripetal force that's its class name the gravity is a manifestation of centripetal force that's when the same line it's on the same radial line but it's in the reverse spherical direction and if it's spinning that's chirality that's space contra space chirality well it wouldn't be space contra space it's force contra force but in hyperspheric space essentially the same thing happens because when you orient the spherical universe centripetality is spinning in one chiral direction so in hyperspace everything is the same but reversed on chirality so it's a chiral anti-chiral relationship on a centripetal centrifugal force balance sphere and now you have a hypersphere that explains a lot because this also is the location of imaginary space we have not yet been able to see what i just described but i hope that at least makes tentative sense to you because now we're going to put it all together so that it does make sense both geometrically and mathematically and this is a good chance to show the power of the integral number system that i discovered it's simply a two component number system where the numbers are all whole unit fractions only it's a complex form and the only reason we don't say complex form is there's already a name for it it's reciprocal form and it doesn't use anything imaginary we already have imaginarity in two locations in the geometry beyond the outer edge is the outer imaginary space and at the center which is the reciprocal quantity of the greatest number so the finite boundary of the universe is at the limit of infinity such that at the boundary is a number that you cannot use in the system because it's a hybrid number just like a complex number it's a fraction like all other numbers and it is a whole unit fraction as all of these numbers are but this one is special because it of course is imaginary because it's lazy 8 over 1 because of the nature of the space which is actually proportional space we call it multiplicative space there has to be a reciprocal number to balance the system this is a universal physical principle which was pointed out bo both by newton and by emmy noether and newton was too young to get a nobel prize there was no nobel yet but uh, emmy got a nobel prize and she was only the second woman to win the nobel prize in physics following 
Madame Curie, who I believe she got it twice. So it is proper to set up the geometry this way in order to define the radial line, which is one line. There's only one radial line in the geometry. This takes the place of three lines, but really we're replacing the three-line 3D system, which the three is forced because of orthogonality. But if you start spherically, you, you only need one of these lines, but it has two aspects, and they're overlaid because it's a force. We already know one of them. It's centripetal force. What science has been unable to identify as such yet is there has to be a centrifugal force. Well, to locate that centrifugal force that balances centripetal force in spherical space, essentially gravity, but really the proton-electron relationship. Well, there it is. That is it. So what are we seeing when we see a proton and an electron? You're seeing one particle, at least, that manifests centripetal force. That would be the proton, because it does the same thing to space that gravity does. There is a, there is a characteristic difference, which is um, worth, certainly worth consideration, but essentially they're both centripetal force. They pull, they pull space in, in very similarly. And in fact, the way we measure the potential for gravity is from the number of protons. The definition of mass is the number of space particles. And if you say space particle, as I have taught, been teaching, is the right way to say it if you want insight, then the electron suggests itself as the non-spatial particle. Can we say that? We must say it, because that's exactly its precision description to get the geometry correct. That the electron is the counterpart of the spatial particle to the proportion that the proton is a space particle. It appears to know nothing of time, but the electron could be said to be pure time. It's non-spatial. It doesn't have a precise spatial characteristic, but it has a definite advantage over the proton. It has a clock. The electron is a clock. It's one of Einstein's clocks. I've never heard another scientist say that. The reason it can be called such is because it has a pendular action. It has an oscillatory action. These are spherical functions. They're functions on the sphere. They're not linear concepts. They can't even be conceived with linear logic because it doesn't involve spatial separation. It involves an entirely different principle. In the same way, though, that magnetism differs from electricity, they actually are the same phenomenon. And that's a mind bender. And this gets right to the nature of superposition, and this will explain entanglement when you see this just a little bit further, simply to perceive the actual geometric shift. Because the radial line is pure straightness in all directions. When you stand up from your chair on the surface of the earth, for instance, you make an absolutely straight line through your body that goes directly from the edge of the universe and beyond, if you want to add, like, as Buzz Lightyear might say, and it comes right down. It's a force line through the top of your head, through your prana, down through the bottom of your torso, between your legs, directly to the center of gravity with an absolute precision that man cannot even recreate. The most perfect line in the universe. But gravity is not that line. It's the radial line in all directions. That same line of force is underneath your feet, through the center of the earth, up on the other side of the world, 
where another human is standing up and your feet are facing each other. That is not a linear dimension. You have to go around the surface of the globe to figure that out, that gravity is a centripetal force. It's equal in all directions. That's a spherical function, but on a linear component of spherical space. That's called the radial line, and it describes accurately by changing its orientation alone, nothing else, centripetal or centrifugal force. We can see centripetal in two manifestations at macro scale and micro scale. This means that the universe has a center of gravity no matter how big it is. The problem is we cannot locate it. And so virtually it has no center. Well, you would expect not. It has no edge. You need to put those two facts together. That it has no center because it has no edge. And you can invert that. It has no edge because it has no center. And those are two completely different statements that fit together. And now you're seeing the dimensionality of the geometric potential of this brand new vision of real physics. This describes the Bohr atom and it's the only construction that can do so. It will describe everything spherical but it has to be described spherically, not with linear numbers. Now the linear numbers must be used to compose the spherical numbers. I've proved that. That's how I began this series two years ago is because of this major breakthrough to find that there is a spherical number system. It's remarkable to say that it has the characteristics of the complex number system that puts imaginarity where we actually find it, which is in two places, beyond the edge and inside the center. These are two imaginary infinities that if you turn them into proportionality on one makes your first spherical number two fractions, each of which has a one in it. The one is in the denominator for infinity at the outer edge, showing that infinity is outside, but one is inside. And that's called a fraction. And infinity over one can be linearized to infinity. So this is an interesting integration. But that's called a proportional number. The center has to be the reciprocal so you can get the Archimedean of spherical space the same way you've got zero out of the linear systematic space. Indeed, from 1D, you have to start at 0D. That's called null. It doesn't exist. You have to force it to have a numeric quantity, which we call zero, in order to have your index of linear spatial separation. That's only for space. That is not how you get time. But we measure time linearly. Why? Because of the tick of the clock. There has to be a clock to have time. Where is that clock? It's not in the proton. The proton affects space. But the electron is a manifestation of energy. It's energy in a specific state called angular momentum. The energy is bound to the surface of the sphere. In the electron, it's a pure wave. That's called a standing wave. And that means that there's a centripetal component somehow. To the exact proportion, there has to be a centrifugal center to the proton. Do you know why? The, the proton does not just exhibit centripetal force. It also has centrifugal force inside. Why? Because it makes a force field to the electron. That is known. That is not speculation. But I'm not the first man to notice that. Well, I couldn't be or I couldn't say it's not speculation. That's actually well known, but isn't that interesting? 
Well, if you look at the electron, it's the man manifestation of centrifugal force. It's energy trying to spin out. And it demonstrates that when it releases a photon. Because that's exactly what a photon is. It's energy spinning out to the proportion that the proton is pulling space in, the electron is pushing against the opposite surface. And those are the two balancing forces at subatomic scale. I've never heard anybody say it that way, but it goes deeper and gets better because now we have a definition of time. But it's not linear. Time is linear if you linearize the phenomenon that you're measuring. But what you're measuring is periodicity. You're measuring frequency. You're measuring angular momentum. You're measuring a two-part phenomenon on the surface of the sphere. It does not leave the surface of the sphere. That is the second dimension. The first dimension I already described to you on the centrifugal centripetal force line. That's not an exact match on the universe. It's only an exact match on the atom. Because the universe has neither center nor edge. But the atom has a center. The atom does have a center with respect to the electron. And the electron has a presence when there's a proton, if the electron is not attached to the proton in a shell formation, it's very difficult to describe what the electron is. But it's much easier to describe what it is when it's in its shell state around a proton. You know where that shell state exists? It's called a Lagrangian point. But instead of being a Lagrangian point, it's a Lagrangian shell. It's the intersection of two spherical surfaces. Inside is one force keeping the electron from getting in. That force has a name. That's your centrifugal force of the proton. The electron does not appear to have a centripetal force, but it has to, or it would fly apart as a photon does. A photon does not have centripetal force. It's been released from its centripetal force attractor or basis. And so the photon flies out. That's the definition of being released from centripetal attraction. So both particles exhibit both forces inversely with a twist though, and it's literally a twist they're not polar opposite, they're actually orthogonal. The two domains, or what I'm calling dimensions, are perpendicular. A sphere is perpendicular to its own radial line. A moment's thought will convince you of that, and if you need a proof, stand up from your chair. And notice the line that you make. And now look at your feet, and answer this as honestly as you can, but say it from the gut, don't be afraid. What is the relationship between your vertical upright body and your horizontal plane of what you're standing on? You could fudge and say it's not a perfect plane. What's the angle, sucker? It's a 90 degree angle. So that's not polar opposite. So this is a shift sideways onto the spherical surface. And that's where we get periodicity, angular momentum, the manifestation of motion itself, and the manifestation of energy. And from that system, which is a clock, something is maintaining a frequency wavelength relationship on the sphere. On the sphere. There's a reciprocal relationship between the wavelength and the frequency. You know what frequency is? It's not spatial. It's not a spatial concept. The wavelength is because it's part of the surface of the sphere. But the periodicity is a different data type. It's a different data type. It's a different data type than space.
That's called the temporal domain, the temporal domain. It only occurs on a sphere. It cannot occur on a line. And so you need to somehow account for that. Well, what we get from that is a concept of time. But you can see we're measuring it incorrectly. Can you not? You know how we measure time? Literally, where do we get the second from? Do you know? It's from the orbit of the Earth around the sun. That's where the notion of the second comes from. There's your clock. That's the clock. It has to be on a circle. It has to be on a closed line so you can have a repeat rate. Well, that's not spatial. You could say it's spatial, but it's not the same dimension because it manifests something that can only be manifested that way. What is that? Energy. This is a simultaneous definition of energy, motion, angular momentum, periodicity, frequency, and wavelength. They're all the same thing, but they're not spatial. You have to force that concept. It's not spatial. It's on the surface of a sphere. Nothing else is. That's the temporal domain. And what we measure is an aspect of energy. And, the, and so time is a derivative. It's the derivative of energy. That can be proved. Well, that's interesting because that's orthogonal. And the shape of the Bohr atom proves that. It makes the exact replica of a shell system where the center has centripetal force, but not only centripetal force. From Newton to Einstein to today, there's only ever been one of the two forces in the universe that's ever been identified. Just one. As if Emmy Nurter never lived. As if, as if Sir Isaac Newton himself had never said, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. As if there were no such thing as force conservation. We have centripetal force everywhere. At atomic scale and at macro scale, we have gravity. Who ever taught you the other force that has to balance that? Because it's pulling space into a point. That's the whole idea of the singularity of the black hole. That is the result of pulling space into a point when it's a linear point. That's zero. That's null. It doesn't exist. So what's the actual center? Because that you see, that misses. That actually misses reality. You missed because of your number system. Your number system led you to a fake center. The universe does not have a singularity at its center anywhere. Anywhere. You invented it with your mathematics because you haven't grown up. You're still using Greek numbers, essentially where you invented zero sometime in the AD, zero got in there, which has been since proved that you needed to have a consistent index for a linear space. But that zero is a derivative number. It's the infinitesimal of the line. And then you reduce physical space, which is spherical, to a null point, a zero dimensional, and you wonder why everything turns inside out. And now you say you discovered that in the universe. Um, I'm here to correct you. You did not discover that. And therefore, also, your Big Bang is, has to be wrong because you made another singularity. They all say it. They're proud of it, and they say, well, there's the ultimate mystery. Oh, it certainly is because you got it wrong. That's why. So what do we have at the center of space? We have a proton. Well, what do we have at the center of anything else? Nothing. That's it. We only see space. We don't see angular momentum. Uh, you know, you just don't see that. Of course, you could find it. Planets go around stars. See, we can learn from that. But you see, we only listened to Newton. We didn't listen to the scientist who came right on the heels of Newton. Practically in a biblical sense, as Newton's heels were being tucked into his coffin, 
Ruger Yosef Boschkevich was being dragged out of his mommy's womb, maybe by his heels. I think they're supposed to come head first. That would be a breach birth, actually, I think. Whatever. And Ruger said, very simply, without doing anything, he really admired Newton. But he said, well, I have something to add to what Newton said. He said there's not just a centripetal force which is the only force that Newton identified, and that's true to this day. He said, no, there has to be a centrifugal force, and he identified it, and he had never even heard of an atom or a particle. That was well over a century in the future before the electron would be discovered, followed shortly by the proton, followed shortly by the, at the atomic system itself, Actually, by Niels Bohr. Bohr, he's usually given credit for that, I think. And so there's your true particle-particle relationship, and that's the end of the standard model. As far as explaining anything in reality, the standard model has great value for industry, but it has no value for humans. In science, we need to get the actual answers that the real universe gives, and we don't care about your need for power sources. You, with the blessings of the universe, may you find your next power source, and many of us around the world will be praying that you don't use it to destroy humans, but we already know that's the reason you want it. So God bless you if he can with your plan, with your standard model of particle physics, which explains nothing, but might get you your next uh, candy bar. However many people it kills. Well, in real science, we actually want the real answers for perhaps not exactly the same reason, right? So we do want to know what really science is incapable of guiding us toward, which is what's actually going on. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to know what the solution is to the quantum paradox? Let me ask you a leading question for our next lecture or presentation, as the case may be. What do you say is the quantum paradox? You know, leave a comment if you want, but I suggest you go through this in your mind. Be sure that you have a conception of the quantum paradox. And by the way, good luck with that. In the next presentation, I'll show you the answer. And then I suppose I could just die. <laughs> There's always going to be some more, but we're going to get into hyperspheric space. Oh, this goes on forever, but understanding is the best game in town. I don't care, really, how many puppies die, okay? Hiroshima, I don't give a shit. I'm sorry. I'm too old to care. I cried for the puppies. I cried for the Japanese. I cried for the Jews. Not, t not anymore. It's just as endless. I, if I'm going <laughs> to... So stay tuned and don't forget to keep looking up when the skies open at night. That's the best time you'll spend on Earth. This is Anna Galactic having a good deal of time.